This is a very special year as we celebrate Clark's 175th anniversary. We are spending this year honoring the significant milestones with events and festivities both on and off campus for the campus community, alumni, and friends. We are thrilled to have Molly Schreiber with us tonight to present the Mack and Maylander Alumni Lecture. Molly has a bachelor's degree in elementary education from Clark and a master's degree from Western Illinois University. Molly wears many hats. She is a successful entrepreneur, business visionary, fitness enthusiast, yoga guru, wife and mother, children's author, and wellness coach. So if you looked up the word optimistic in the dictionary, you might just see her photo. Molly started Challenge to Change Incorporated in Dubuque as a way to inspire people to be happy, healthy, and to live a positive life. The organization teaches lifelong wellness skills for overall support and growth, and instills mind, body, spirit wellness to all ages through practices such as fitness, yoga, meditation, and daily mindfulness techniques. Tonight she will share with us her bold approach to life and her mission to encourage others to take risks, think bigger, and live with purpose. Molly believes that the power to change and live a good life is within us all. Her lecture tonight is Creating Purpose and Happiness in Your Life, Lessons from the Heart. We are very grateful for her time and are so glad to have her back here at Clark as our alumni lecturer. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Molly Schreiber. May I be happy, may you be happy, 
May we all be happy together. So we're going to put our hands at our heart center. This is Patrick's first time performing with us. But he's pretty, he might be a little nervous. But we're actually going to start with our hands at the heart center. And you can do it with us if you want to. And you say, lo ka. And then you press your hands away and say, samasta. And then you say, suki no. Bhava too. So we'll say it again slowly for them, because they're just learning, right? Lo ka samasta suki no bhava too. They did a good job. But it's actually a song. So we're going to sing it and do the motions. And then you can join us when you're ready. So you can just do the hand motions if you're comfortable, or you can sing the song. I met him. I actually transferred. 
for a year from you and I, because I really tried to go to the big city and it didn't work out so well for me. So I came back to the to go to school in here. And I met Kyle when I came to visit. And it's one of those things where you know when you meet someone else's energy and you know it's exactly right. And all of you know someone in your life that you met in that moment. It might have been a friend. It could have been a long lost family member. Or it could have been the love of your life. And you know in that moment that it was right. So Kyle and I dated on and off through college. And we decided, after we got done, that we were going to do everything right. We got married December 30th of 2000. So I can't believe that it's been almost 20 years. It'll be 20 years in May since I graduated from this amazing institution. But also 20 years almost that I would have married this man. Because I, I think I look just like that. <laughs> different. 
we no longer judge. We're more in the present moment. We try new things, and we are completely connected to ourselves. Magic happens in the growth zone. But we love our comfort zone. We love to be in that orange area, don't we? Yeah, we do. I've been there. Sometimes we find our way out of the comfort zone, through the fear zone, into the learning zone, and grow. But sometimes we're pushed. And I was pushed, and I was pushed hard out of my comfort zone. I was living with these amazing little kids and an awesome husband. We were cooking dinner every night, and we were talking about our day every night. We put our kids to bed. It was a fantastic little life. That was my comfort zone. But I was quickly pushed into the fear zone, which eventually made me grow and learn. On May 26th of 2007, Kyle was in a car accident on May 24th, and in 2007, on May 26th, he passed from injuries from his car accident. My world was literally rocked. Literally rocked. I was widowed at the age of 30 with three kids under the age of three. Three kids under the age of three. They were awesome kids. But my foundation was ripped from underneath me. I was immediately put into the fear zone where I had to learn a new normal and grow in a different way. Our first year together kind of looked like this. This was our first year Christmas picture. You can laugh at it because it was a struggle to even get it. We had, it, at the top, that was Maggie at the time. And Maggie, the smiles. That was, we had a lot of smiles that year. The second one, Jacob, that's definitely some mischief going on there. And then the third one is Maria, but look to the left there to her picture. That was, that was her world. So we survived. We survived that first year. And we made it. We got through the fear zone, and we started learning a new way. But we really didn't start to grow because we were still kind of stuck in our way. And that's okay. Everything's a process. Nothing's perfect. Nothing works out absolutely perfect. But I knew that I wanted Kyle's legacy to live on. He was such a positive person. Anybody who met and interacted with him always said to me, and this is one thing that someone said to me, I couldn't figure out if he was really just that genuinely nice or if he was a used car salesman. <laughs> but that's kind of how he was. That was his energy. He was a dynamic person. And if you didn't like him, he would work until you made him like you. And that's the type of person. And I wanted that energy to live on, not only for me, but for my kids. And I wanted them more than anything else to have a happy life. I didn't want to pull the covers up over my head and cry and moan and live a negative life. I wanted to come out kicking and screaming and make a difference in this world. I wanted his positive energy to live on. I decided that I determined the future for my kids. One of my daycare providers said to me at that time, Molly, if you're not happy, no one's going to be happy, and those kids are going to be miserable. What makes you happy? And at that time, I really had to think, what does make me happy? You know, I mean, I'm happy being a mom, but I really wasn't doing anything for myself. But when I was staying at home, I started to go to yoga classes. And I found that when I was in those yoga classes, that I was more connected to myself, mind, body, breath, than ever before in my life. When I walked off the mat, I was nicer to Kyle. I was a better mom and a better friend. So I decided to check out some yoga classes. So I found some yoga classes back here in Dubuque, because we had moved back here. And I found some at Body and Soul, an amazing place to go. And I decided when I was there, that this is the missing link in education. We are adults, and we just get on our mats to learn to self-regulate. Why aren't we teaching this to kids? Why aren't we teaching this to kids? That's where my journey began. During that time, I met an amazing man on a blind date at Dairy Queen. That was our first blind date. And he agreed to blend a family with me. And this is what we looked like. <laughs> this is our first little family picture, minus Sydney at a family wedding. And I love this picture so much because it tells, continues to tell the story of our first year. But we add Tom's face in going, oh my God, what did I do? <laughs> so I love the smiles again from Maggie. 
the mischief from Jacob. And that's just me. <laughs> so we are now the Schreiber family. This is my stepdaughter, Sydney. She's an amazing human being. She's 22 years old. She's a senior at the University of Iowa, and she will go on to law school at Iowa in the fall. Maggie is now 15, and she's a senior at Dubuque, or I'm sorry, a freshman at Dubuque Senior. And Jacob and Maria are in seventh grade at Washington Middle School. And we definitely have an amazing new normal. But it wasn't easy to get there. It was a journey. But it's a journey of really looking into yourself, finding out what makes you tick, and finding the journey, getting out of the fear zone, learning and growing through each and every experience. So my family is part of my mission at Challenge to Change. They're a big heartbeat of how this all happens. Here we are at our studio opening. And when I found that yoga was pretty amazing and that I connected and it was the missing link for education, I decided to go on and pursue not only my 200 level yoga certification, but get what's called a 95 hour, where you learn how to teach it to kids, teens, toddlers, so you take it to a next level. So my very supportive husband supported me as I went into Chicago once a month for six months to get this certification. And while I was there, I decided I'm doing this full force. I knew I wanted to stay in education. I knew I didn't want to continue to be a stay-at-home mom. I wanted to have a bigger purpose in my life. I knew from my practice of yoga that was very important to me. So I decided that I was going to make a challenge to change a physical business for our community and open the doors and offer yoga to children. So these, these are the, this is one of my yogis that you just saw up here. Um, this is Grace. Grace, can you wait? She's up there. Yeah. Grace is a pretty special yogi. She's holding one of her mantra cards there that says, I am unique. So I love this picture of her. But our mission is to take yoga and mindfulness to every student in Dubuque. And we are making that happen through our Yoga in the Schools project. So when we opened the doors of Challenge to Change, the plan was to have classes at the studio and offer some adult classes and things to make the studio thrive. But then, I just can't sit still. I don't know where I got it from. And I decided that I wanted to approach the school district and got together with them. And we had someone in the community approach us at the same time and say, tell us about a grant that they offer. And they offer this money to do a yoga program in the schools. So the very first year, which was two years ago, we picked four elementary schools in Dubuque. We picked the two lowest and the two highest schools based on free and reduced lunch. And we decided that we were going to implement a half an hour yoga practice into every single classroom. So we were going into their safe space to deliver a 30-minute yoga practice. The five parts of practice of what were delivered, and it's a curriculum that I developed. We did that the first year. We had an amazing researcher from Kansas University come on and decide that it was a good idea to have everything researched. Because anything in education needs to have science behind it as well to tell it. <coughs> so, we did a two-pronged study. The first part of the study is, do children based on the curriculum know how to self-regulate? And do they understand what yoga and mindfulness is? So the two-pronged study happened in year one, and the results were astounding. So we grew to seven schools this year. Seven schools in Dubuque, but then little outlying districts started to hear about what we were doing and took us on. And then we're doing the yoga project in their classroom. Not only is this getting delivered to students, but it's also helping to put the oxygen mask on the staff. Because students that are coming into the elementary classrooms these days have the highest ACE numbers that have ever existed. They have experienced traumas that we can't even imagine. Can't even imagine what they have gone through. An ACE score of zero is very unusual anymore. So we went on and we're doing our Yoga in the Schools project, continuing the study in Dubuque Community Schools. Next year we're slated to hit all the elementaries in Dubuque Community Schools. But not only just Dubuque, I'm now in March, on March, this day in March, I'm contracted in 23 schools for next year. So the business is grown by three times in one year, and it's only March. So we are training. Can you 
tell I geek out on my work. <laughs> so we do the yoga in the schools program, and we support the teachers, we support the students, and then at the end of the year we do a school combination where we have all the students in the gym together celebrating and teach them how to take their practices out of their classroom and into their daily life, how to work on it in the summer. So if you have an instance in your life that you need to work on or something scary happened, how can you deal with that? Mindfulness, there's so many studies that mindfulness and yoga, they help to mitigate the effects of trauma. And so implementing these practices into the daily classroom only help those students who have these traumas. So this is the picture of the four of us walking into our very first school day. I started with four of us teaching. And next year, our staff will be upwards of 14. So it's pretty amazing as well. So a big part of what we do, too, is train educators how to implement these practices. Not every school gets to be lucky enough to be a yoga school. Not every district can afford it. Not every district has the opportunity to write grants. And so we um, will train trainers how to do it and implement it into their schools as well. And they're starting to become just multiplied and multiplied, which is amazing to know that so many flight workers live in our schools now and can implement these practices. So to top that off, we decided that we needed to continue to support this project. Year one, this amazing person in our community, her name's Ann McDonough, if you know her, go for her. She didn't pay me to do that. She's an amazing human being. She gave us money, seed money, from her family foundation to start this project. But we knew that couldn't happen every year. It couldn't happen every year. So we started a nonprofit called Mindful Minutes for School. And the Mindful Minutes for School continues this program for schools. Right now, our focus is on Dubuque Community Schools, but we're hoping to hit outlying districts and also support teachers who want to take the training. So it's anyone who wants to implement the practices of yoga and mindfulness. How can you get the knowledge? And how can you do this? Right now, we're running a campaign called Be One of Our 100. So we're looking for 100 donors to donate $100 to help fund this program for next year. Because our budget next year is $80,000 for Dubuque Community School. But I have no doubt that we'll raise it because we live in an amazing community. So tonight I'm here to talk to you about creating a, part, a life of purpose and happiness. Lessons from my heart. The first thing that I want to tell you about, the first thing you can do to live a life of happiness and purpose is to pray and or meditate daily. How many of you, and no need to raise your hand, but how many of you have a daily practice where you take time to pause, close your eyes, and breathe? Maybe that comes with a rote prayer, or maybe that just is the inhalation and exhalation of your breath. We have over 50,000 thoughts a day. Over 50,000. If you're like me, you probably have 70,000, right? How many of you are like that? Yeah, yeah. 90% of those thoughts that you have every day are the thoughts that you've had the day before, and the day before, and the day before, and the day before. So they create what are called neural pathways, like little grooves in your brain. So they create these little stories. So let's say that a child says to themselves, I am so stupid. I am so stupid. I am so stupid. Their brain takes on that story. And guess what they become? Yeah. Because 80% of those 50,000 thoughts that we have every day, 80% of them are negative thoughts. It's not the human's default to be a positive thinker. It's not. It's to be negative. We have to work extra hard to be a positive thinker. It's not the natural thing to happen. So we need to start to change the stories in our head. And we can do that through prayer and meditation. I can give you a couple strategies tonight to tell you how to do that. And I encourage you to meditate daily. I'm going to show you a couple techniques. But it could just be closing your eyes, listening to your breath, Perhaps saying a prayer, if you're afraid. It's that simple. Our minds are like computers. You know what I'm talking about when the computer all of a sudden starts getting wonky 
and he can't figure it out. And then we call him the tech guy, and he like just does something and then it works fine. Well, he just probably did like the hard restart where he shuts it down and starts it back up. That's all he did, but you think he's like that. Well, our brains are like that. Our brains sometimes need the hard restart because it starts to get all wonky and the stories get all mixed up, and we need to do the hard restart. But in the society that we're in today, we're not doing the hard restart. We're not taking time to pause, turn off the external stimuli, and breathe. Today, we wake up to an alarm clock called a cell phone. We are connected all day long to technology. We send our kids to school, and they're on a smart board from the beginning of the morning to the end of the day. They're on their iPads and laptops. Technology is awesome. It's amazing. But we need to find the balance. Because the balance right now, it's not really happening. So taking time away from the computer, closing your eyes, and breathing, connecting your mind, body, and breath. I challenge you to live a life of purpose and happiness this next week, just for one week. Try to take a pause. Even if it's just two minutes, and you do it once a day, you're going to notice a difference. You're going to notice you're connecting. You're going to notice you're calmer. You're going to notice your actions and reactions, especially the heavy situations, are different. The second way that I would tell you to live a life of happiness and purpose is to compromise. This is Tom and I, two months before we got married. We decided we were going to buy a boat. No, it was two months before we got engaged. We knew we were going to get married. We like fell fast and fell hard for each other at Dairy Queen. <laughs> they should write a song about that. <laughs> but we decided we were going to purchase a boat together. And we wanted to have a family that would be a river family. And we bought this boat, and when we went to go buy it, Tom decided that we should name our boat. And so we did. Guess what we named it? Tom Permise. Tom Permise. Because he said we will have a great marriage as long as we always Tom Permise. <laughs> he had no idea. He put the white dress on me, and the laugh was on him, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. He had no idea what he was getting himself into. But we would never, ever have been able to create this, this blended family, if we didn't compromise. It was not an easy ride. I had my family. He had his family. We had our extended family. I like to call us our functional dysfunction because we have his, we have mine, and we have Kyle's. But it works. It works. But it's not always easy. But you have to be intentional about every step, every step of the road. Not always happy to be right. One of the greatest things I learned from Tom, he's the smartest man I ever have met in my life, but he won't remember your face. <laughs> He told me, do you want to be right, or do you want to be happy? And we both live by that mantra now. Because almost most of the time when we disagree now, one of us will say, you're right, you're right. And then it's like, oh, that's, oh, that's good. You just got me right there saying you're right. Because we both know that you don't always have to be right, but you need to be happy. And we went through a long road of getting to that point. But when you can get to the other side, and you can work through that, and you can compromise, not compromise, uh -huh. molly wise, <laughs> then things work. And because we were able to develop this amazing family and have this amazing time on Sydney's 20th birthday, this was able to develop. Because of our compromise, Tom was able to switch jobs, and I was able to open the physical doors and challenge the change because of the support that I had from him. So when you compromise, when you don't always have to be right, but you be happy, amazing things can happen. And because this has happened, this can happen. Newspaper articles, media, news stories, positive energy for schools. Whoever thought that we would have that? 
Schools are becoming a harder and harder place to work and to be. So anything we can do to make life a little bit easier. Kids are experiencing so much more than we can imagine. Suicide is on the rise. We have to do something as a community. We need to start with the young people and let it trickle up. We have to do something. My third thing is connect your smart mind to your kind heart and calm your body. This is the third thing to make yourself live a happy life. At Challenge to Change, we have a mantra. Your smart mind is connected to your kind heart, which calms your body. Think about that. So your smart mind, when it's not working efficiently, when you're telling yourself those negative stories and you're listening to them, what happens? We can't access the kind heart. The kind heart gets frustrated, it gets angry, and our body language starts to react. And our bodies are calm anymore, and our facial expressions come. And sometimes people push, hit, kick. They do all sorts of things with their calm body. So we have to start with the smart mind. And that begins with meditation and prayer. That begins with connecting to the kind heart and not always being right, but being happy, which takes you into the calm body, which is where the practice, the physical practice of yoga can come. We always tell kids, look at your smart mind. What's it doing right now? What's going on in it? And is it connecting to your kind heart? Now, can you calm your body? The techniques we're going to teach you tonight, the next few techniques, are ones to help you connect your smart mind, your kind heart, and calm your body. And there are two techniques that I include. I encourage you to practice and do that on a daily basis. The first one is practicing gratitude. These are our mantra cards at Challenge to Change, and we tell kids that mantra, oh, I'm sorry. I've got to talk a little bit more about mindfulness, apparently. <laughs> so, connecting your smart mind to your kind heart and calming your body is the practice of mindfulness. And mindfulness goes hand in hand with yoga. Mindfulness is the pause between the action and the reaction. It's the pause between the action and the reaction. It takes 13 seconds for an emotion to come at you, hit you, you to feel it in your body, and to react. We never wait 13 seconds. We just react. Mindfulness is when you come back to the present moment over and over and over again. When we allow an emotion to come at us, to feel it physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and let it pass, that's mindfulness. So often, we're not living in the present moment. We're either living in the future, stuff that hasn't happened yet, we're worrying, we're being fearful, and that brings about anxiety, not living in the present moment. Or we're living in the past. I should have done this. I wished I would have done this. And that brings about depression. Those are the two anchors in the medical community right now that doctors would tell you that they serve. Depression and anxiety, especially in our young people. So why are we not teaching more mindfulness and yoga to kids? Why are we not teaching them to be in the present moment and connect their smart mind to their kind heart to calm that body. We tell our kids, sit still. Have we taught them how to sit still? We tell them to be kind. Have we taught them tools of how to be kind? We have to do that. Because mindfulness is so important. It creates better characters for the future. It enables us to be non-judgmental. We are such a judgmental society. We hold ourselves to a standard of social media and we can't do that. That's not real. So practicing mindfulness brings you back to the present moment, connects you to who you are, and makes you realize, I'm okay. I am enough. So now I'm going to move on to the, my favorite one, so I was jumping ahead because this is my favorite one to talk about. Number four, practice gratitude. This is the most powerful way to mitigate the effects of negativity is to practice gratitude. These are our mantra cards that we have at Challenge to Change. And the mantra cards are phrases 
that are I am statements to help the kids change their negative thinking to positive ones. So this one simply says, I am grateful. And we do an activity with kids called a gratitude rampage. So the word gratitude, when we ask kids, what does it mean? Being thankful. And what is the word rampage? We've got to be careful and hold our breath when we ask that. But rampage means to do something over and over again in a crazy, crazy way. So when you put those two words together, when you put gratitude and rampage together, it's being thankful and grateful over and over again in a crazy, loud way. There's no other way to change a vibration in a room than talking about things that are important to you and things that you love. So I want you to close your eyes right now. And we're going to go on a gratitude rampage. And I want you, and you can use your fingers if you want, I want you to think of ten things that you're grateful for right now. They can be people. They can be situations in your life. They can be food. They can be pizza. They can be anything you want. Things that are grateful. And it's okay if they're egocentric. So think of those ten things. And when I tell you to open your eyes, I would love it if you turned to somebody next to you and went on a gratitude rampage. A gratitude rampage is when you go back and forth saying the things that you're grateful for. So if I had a partner up here, I would say my mom, and they might say their dad, and I would say pizza, and they might say wine. So you get to decide what your gratitude rampage is. When you get to the end of 10 things, just look at that person and notice what happened. Open your eyes, turn to somebody near you, and go back and forth saying things you're grateful for. <laughs>
Positive energy attracts positive energy. Negative energy, it attracts negativity. Think of the five people that you hold closest to you in your life. What's their energy like? It's always something to think about. If you practice gratitude, how will their energy change? Number five, I love this one. This is another one of our lessons that we do with the Yoga in the Schools program. We teach kids to meta. And meta is the art of spreading love <coughs> and kindness. And I say art because I, it is an art to spread love and kindness. It's like painting the world with happiness. Meta can be done anywhere, at any time, to anyone. And it should be practiced all the time. Meta is four phrases. The four phrases are, may you be happy. May you be healthy. May you feel loved. May you be safe. You always start practicing meta by doing it on yourself. Because if you don't feel happiness, if you don't feel love, if you don't feel good, you can't be good for anybody else. So I invite you to put your hands on your heart and close your eyes. And I want you to repeat these phrases after me as I say them. But before you do that, I want you to visualize the picture of yourself. So it could be your picture from school. It could be your picture on your wedding day. It could be a picture of you doing something really silly. But as I say these four phrases, imagine that you are saying them to yourself. May I be happy. Good job, Cooper. May I be healthy. May I feel loved. May I be safe. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I feel loved. May I be safe. What's wrong with doing that every day to yourself? And if your mom or dad, I tell kids, catch you doing that, you know what you should tell them? They should do it too, because they need to do it too. The next people that you should meta in your life are people that you love very much. That's the most important after yourself to meta. So again, close your eyes and imagine a picture of someone that you love very much. So maybe it's a person sitting next to you, or maybe it's someone that has passed on. Or maybe that person is sitting at home. Put your hands on your heart or on your lap. Are you comfortable? And imagine a picture of them. And as I say these four phrases, imagine you're saying them to that person. May you be happy. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you feel love. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you feel loved. May you be safe. It feels so good to let a people that you love. And you can do it all the time, anywhere. And sending that positive vibration off to them, it really reaches them. And it truly does make a difference in their day. The third person that you should meta, and the most important, is someone that you don't like very much. And the kids know when we do this at school that it's important. It can be someone you got to fight with out of recess. It could be someone who has been mean to you, or someone that you love very much. So think of this moment of someone that you don't like very much. If you're not comfortable closing your eyes, that's okay. Otherwise, close your eyes, imagine a picture of that person. Put your hands on your heart if it's comfortable, or on your lap. And imagine that you're saying these four phrases to that person that you don't like very much. May you be happy. 
May you be healthy. May you be healthy. May you feel loved. May you feel loved. May you be safe. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be healthy. May you feel loved. May you feel loved. May you be safe. May you be safe. It's very hard to practice metta on people that you don't like very much, but it's the most important because there's a magic word that starts to happen in your brain and in your heart and in your body, and it's called forgiveness. Anybody ever heard that word? Yeah, it's an important practice to do. When you meta yourself, you're forgiving yourself. When you meta those you love, you're spreading your love and kindness. But when you meta those you don't like very much, you're changing any negative relationship that you may have had. And negative relationships, they only hold us back. They keep us in a fear zone. So I invite you, and you don't have to have these four phrases perfect. You can just simply say four nice phrases to that person. But I invite you to meta people all the time, everywhere. I always tell my close friends, if I'm sending you this JK, it's either because I'm thinking about you and I love you, or you really make me mad. <laughs> so when I send it to my friends, they'll be like, oh, I'm getting this. <laughs> but meta many people as much as you can. So I could have came here tonight and told you to create a life of purpose and happiness, that to smile more, <coughs> laugh more, those are automatic. I think those are givens. But I wanted to give you more deeper, more meaningful purposes in life. These are the lessons from my heart to yours, sharing with you practices that I have found to be really beneficial to me and in this community of children that I serve. The very first one is to pray or meditate every day. Pray and or meditate. I think they're interchangeable. I think when you pray, you're talking to God, and when you meditate, he talks to you. Number two, compromise. Remember, do you want to be right and uncomfortable, or do you want to be happy? Number three, always think about what your smart mind is doing. Remember, you're not your thoughts. Your thoughts are not facts. They're just thoughts, and you have 50,000 of them. 80% of them are negative, so change those smart minds to be positive thoughts. Connect it to your kind heart and calm that body. Sit still in silence. The fourth one, my favorite, practice gratitude. Practice it as much as you can, and also notice what happens. Because mindfulness is the act of noticing the difference from the before and after. And the fifth one is to meta. Meta yourself every day. Change those negative thoughts to positive ones. Meta those that you love. Meta your children when they're at school. Meta your parents that are in Arizona in the sunshine. Meta everybody that you can. But meta those that you don't like very much. Meta those who need it the most. Those are my five tips to living a life of purpose and happiness. If they would let me talk for three hours, I could have kept you busy. But I narrowed it down to my top five lessons of living that life. So I thank you tonight. And here are some boys here. This is the perfect picture of one of our parts of practice that we do in yoga school. They're called mudras. And mudras tell you what mood you're in, and they help kids self-regulate. And we always know as teachers that if the kids are hands busy, the bodies are still. So we have them hold their hands in certain ways. So I'm going to invite my young yogis to come up and teach you from a mudra, and it's from our favorite mudra. Our favorite mudra is the lotus flower. And it's a close of practice that we use to close out our community time together. And it's called Let Peace Begin With Me. Cooper's just starting yoga, guys. Yeah. So we're going to take our hands in the lotus flower mudra. And the lotus flower is a beautiful flower that grows from the darkest and dirtiest of circumstances. So it grows from the bottom of a yucky, dirty, dark stone where there's really no hope for it. But that lotus flower seed, it believes. 
and it fights its way through that dirty, dark water all the way to the top of the water and pops into this beautiful flower for everyone to see. So the lotus flower represents that even though bad things happen, we can grow, we can change, we can get out of the fear zone and learn and grow and become these beautiful, amazing flowers for everybody to see and have a life of happiness. So we're going to take our lotus flower um, fingers apart. We're going to start with our pinkies. So this might be, you can do it a little different, Cooper and Patrick, because we teach it younger to our younger kids. We teach it different to our younger kids. Take your pinkies together and say the word let. Take your thumbs together and say the word peace. Peace. Take your ring finger together and say the word begin. Begin. Take your pointer finger together and say with. With. And take your center finger together and say me. Me. Now let's go backwards. Take your center finger apart and say the word let. Let. Take your pointer finger apart and say the word peace. Peace. Take your ring finger apart and say begin. Begin. Your thumb apart and say with. With. And your pinky apart and say now focus on your lotus flower, and we're going to say this mantra five times together. And I hope it resonates from my heart to yours. Let peace begin with me. Let peace begin with me. Let peace begin with me.
So I hired my first full-time person. She's here tonight. She's starting July 1st. Her name's Julie Murphy. She's a middle school and high school teacher. And she is better than me. She can do everything I can do but better. So I'm so excited to bring her on board. So let's give her a round of applause. And then we have some of our board members from Mindful Minutes here tonight, so I just want to thank them for coming too as well. I appreciate that and the support of the mission. Because it's not something that everybody thinks to support. It's easy to support lots of other missions. This is an unusual one, but it's one that's on the rise, and it's one that needs to happen from the ground floor up. Because if we present it to high schoolers tomorrow, we need to sit and breathe. They will laugh at us. It has to be taught from the young age up. It has to become part of who they are and what they experience every day of school. What a different world we could have if we did that, right? Any other questions? Katie. Can you tell us about your feedback from your educators? Thank you. So um, the yoga in the schools program supports the teachers as well. The feedback has been astounding. Um, some of them have said, don't ever take this away from us. It's difficult for teachers to let go of the reign of their classroom for 30 minutes and let another person come in and teach. So it's hard for them. But they have really trusted us to do that. And the feedback has been great. Our teacher surveys have been astounding um, on, you know, on what they've said, the five parts of practice and how they use it. There's a range right now of how much teachers implement. We have some teachers who implement a ton every day. And we have some who do nothing except for the 30 minutes that we're there. I developed an online system that all the teachers get and are serviced on. It's called teachable.com that has videos and audio tracks and all these JPEGs and different things, lessons that they can teach the kids when we're not there. So we have this huge resource of things that they can use. And we have some teachers who do it multiple times a day and some who only have us come in and do 30 minutes. I believe as they become more comfortable, and it becomes part of their life, that they'll notice. So right now we're in-servicing the teachers a lot on self-care because that's something that educators need. They need to take care of themselves. They need to put the oxygen mask on themselves so they can take care of the kids that they serve. Thanks, Katie. Christine? Yeah, um, I wanted to hear some feedback on the teachers that children So it's pretty amazing um, what's going on at their school right now. 
So it's different levels right now, but our hope is that it just becomes part of the way that things happen. Um, you know, it's, it's phone call after phone call from different districts as they start to hear. Um, we had visitors from Grinnell last week who came and watched our yoga in the schools program, and they want it now. And so it's sending teachers there, and I just had another email from another school in Grinnell that will come. And I was on the phone with Texas today. I mean, it's just, it's growing. They see the need for it, that brain health needs to be more addressed. Um, we just don't completely understand it, and we need to take care of our children. So um, I believe that this is all on the rise. So thank you for coming.